The monster of Florence. The disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. Italy is no stranger to enduring mysteries, leaving behind more questions than answers. While these cold cases do need to be solved, they have a tendency to overshadow many other lesser known cases. With that in mind, in today's episode, we aim to shed light on three strange mysteries from Italy. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. If you've tuned in to a cold case detective video in the last year, odds are you've heard us rave about our exciting partnership with Magellan TV, the best source for the hottest and most intriguing true crime content available online. You know about their documentaries and bingeable television shows and how they go beyond the realm of true crime to deliver unbelievable deep dives into other topics like space or history or the supernatural. In other words, there is always something to watch, no matter where your interests lie. This week we are highlighting the documentary The Crater, a true Vietnam story a 57-minute picture taking us inside the mind of a former Australian conscript who served in the Vietnam War. The show doesn't simply focus on the terror of war, however, but rather takes us through the hidden darkness that came with digging mass graves for the North Vietnamese soldiers. They do a difficult job of balancing themes of history, horror, and the impact deathly conflict has on mental health, telling an intriguing story while bringing humanity to those who were victims of destruction, regardless of which side they were on. It respects the subjects of tragedy, exactly how we curate our own videos here on Cold Case Detective. The Crater, a true Vietnam story, is also a new release, part of Magellan TV's 15 to 20 hours of brand new content they add to their library each week, always leaving fans of true crime and other relevant topics with something fresh to binge and enjoy. Use the link in the description to access a free month trial and jump into the jaw-dropping adventure of The Crater, a true Vietnam story, and other top-notch documentaries on Magellan TV. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Matthew Mullaney. 21-year-old Matthew Alan Mullaney was last spotted at the Lion's Fountain, an Irish pub located in Florence, on February 1, 2003. A student of Fairfield University in Connecticut, Matthew had travelled to Italy on January 11th to study at the Angel Academy of Art for one semester. His family had last seen him the day before he left the US, but he kept in regular contact with them upon his arrival. His classes had started on January 13th, and he described them as including a lot of criticism and not much praise. Still, he appeared to be enjoying the experience of living abroad, and he was enthusiastic about his course and the new people that he had been meeting during his time in Florence. He had plans to meet up with some of his new friends in Amsterdam in March. By all accounts, Matthew was having a pleasant time abroad, and nothing seemed amiss. The 21-year-old's movements on the day of his disappearance are unknown, until he reached the Lion's Fountain. He stayed at the pub until around 2.30 a.m. and did not appear to be drunk. He spoke with a group of young people near the door before he left for the night. His roommate reported him missing the following day when he noticed Matthew had not come home and his parents were alerted to his disappearance. According to his loved ones, it was not like Matthew to leave without saying anything and go without contacting them. This has caused his friends and family to believe that something untoward happened to the 21-year-old. In the years since his disappearance, Matthew has not used his phone cards, which were prepaid for international calls, nor his bank cards. On the day of his vanishing, he had been carrying his wallet, which contained his Massachusetts state driver's license and health insurance card. He had left his passport behind at the apartment he was staying at in Florence. There is some speculation that Matthew is alive and may still be traveling around Europe. He could be in the Netherlands, England, or Republic of Ireland. There were numerous sightings of the 21-year-old over the next few years. After he went missing, 
He was first allegedly spotted on a train heading from Dover to London on April 5th, 2003. A Dutch national spoke with the young man and later picked him out on CCTV for investigators. The witness claimed Matthew had mentioned traveling to Dublin to look for a job. The second sighting came a few months later, when a witness reported having seen Matthew traveling on a ferry from Holyhead, Wales to Dublin on July 23rd. The witness noticed that a man resembling Matthew became uneasy when officials announced they would be doing immigration checks when they docked. On January 3rd, 2004, a group of men reported seeing Matthew in Galway Island, and less than a month later, witnesses claimed to have seen him in Bologna, Italy, where he seemed thin, unkempt, and unwell. The man claimed to be English and has never been identified. On January 31st, just a few days later, a retired couple visiting the town of Westport in Ireland stated that they'd been approached by a young American man resembling Matthew who'd asked them to take his photo. On April 26th, a bartender in Maynooth Island saw a man she believed was Matthew speaking with two women. She noticed he had an American accent. The final supposed sighting of Matthew occurred on July 2nd, 2005, when an Irish couple claimed that they'd spent the afternoon with him in Kinsale at Oscar Madison's pub. He reportedly introduced himself as Matt from Massachusetts and said he was keeping a journal of his travels in order to write a book. The couple didn't report the sighting for a year as they didn't realize he was a missing person. In recent years, there have been no new updates on Matthew's case. After he vanished, his sister became a full-time student in Dublin while his parents regularly flew over to search for him. But still, answers elude them. Matthew was 21 when he was last seen at the Lion's Fountain, an Irish pub in Florence, Italy, on February 1st, 2003, at around 2.30 a.m. Matthew is described as a white male standing at 5 foot 10 and weighing around 175 pounds. He has dark brown hair, hazel eyes, a mole on his left thigh, and surgical scars on his left ankle from a pin insertion. He also has pierced ears, but wasn't wearing any earrings at the time of his disappearance. He may now have a beard and or mustache, and he has a tattoo of a flaming shamrock at the center of his upper back. At the time of his disappearance, Matthew was wearing a navy blue sweatshirt with a zip-up collar, jeans, and tan suede wallabies ankle boots. If he is still alive, he will be 40 years old. If you have any information about his disappearance, you can submit a tip anonymously to the FBI at tips.fbi.gov. Letitia Chuba On September 25th, 2012, 33-year-old Letitia Chuba phoned her grandmother and arranged a visit. Her grandmother lived just 45 minutes away from Letitia's home in Frejus in southern France. She said she would arrive at around 8 p.m. and would stay the night, and the pair said goodbye. Letitia lived an unextraordinary life. A former police officer, she was now a post office worker and was unmarried and had no children. The only notable thing about her past that has been made public is that Letitia had suffered from bouts of paranoia during her lifetime, sometimes believing she was being followed, spied on, or even persecuted. She was reportedly hospitalized at around the age of 18 for issues of a similar nature, although details on her mental issues are vague at best. They may or may not have contributed to her sudden disappearance in 2012. Earlier that day, Letitia met with a friend and canceled an unspecified appointment. Her movements after she hung up the phone with her grandmother, however, are unclear. At 9.50 p.m., Almost two hours after the 33-year-old was due at her grandmother's house, a motorist called emergency services to report a car driving erratically down the wrong side of the motorway near Bordighera, Italy, two hours away from Letitia's home and in the wrong direction she needed to go to see her grandmother. The car, a black Volkswagen Polo, belonged to Letitia. While the police acted promptly by setting up a roadblock to stop the driver, the vehicle swerved past them and continued on at high speed. A few minutes later, the car was discovered parked in front of a gated holiday resort by the beach. Its headlights had been left on. At 10.15 p.m., a figure was spotted on CCTV running across an access gate to the resort's private beach. The person then climbed over it and sprinted across the sand before disappearing from view. Although the CCTV footage is extremely blurry and unclear, detectives believe 
that the tape shows Letitia. If it is her, this is the last known sighting of her. Inside the Volkswagen, investigators discovered the 33-year-old's mobile phone. Her handbag was on the ground nearby, while the car's documents were strewn on the ground as if they'd been rifled through in a rush. Nothing was missing from the scene. All of Letitia's personal belongings were accounted for. Authorities believe Letitia was the one driving the vehicle. Search and rescue teams were dispatched to find the now missing 33-year-old or any indication that she may have drowned. However, investigators came away from the scene empty-handed. The sea was shallow and calm, and searchers believe there was a 99% chance she would have been found had she been hurt or killed in the water. Scent dogs quickly lost her trail when they were brought in a few days later. At the beginning of the path leading to the beach, authorities discovered a supermarket bag containing clothes, including red trousers, a shirt, and a bra. It is unknown if these items are connected with Letitia in any way. That night, family members grew increasingly concerned as the 33-year-old didn't turn up at her grandmother's house. The following day, they contacted the authorities, who divulged the events of the night before. Letitia's loved ones were baffled by what had occurred. She had no ties to the town or the resort to which she had driven to. Adding to their confusion was the reveal that the day before she vanished, Letitia had spent some time with a friend called Nora and Nora's boyfriend. But nobody, not her family nor her other friends, knew who Nora was. A private investigator hired by Letitia's parents tracked down an individual they believed was the Nora in question. However, she denied knowing Letitia. Puzzled by the entire scenario, the 33-year-old's family theorized that, in a bout of paranoia, she had fled the police and gone into hiding. Letitia reportedly called her ex-boyfriend on the evening of her disappearance at 8.30. She sounded frazzled and repeatedly told him she was lost. This individual, who has not been publicly identified, has an alibi for the time of her disappearance. Letitia's parents have noted that there is a lack of interest from the police in their daughter's case. They have stated that the disappearance was not investigated right away. Instead, they were told that the 33-year-old had drowned and her body would soon wash up on shore. Her car was seized, but it was not checked for fingerprints or DNA. In 2020, the case was reopened and a fresh investigation was started, but Letitia is still missing. If you have any information about her case, you can contact the Frejus Police Station on 0494 519000. Camilla Bini. Born in Somalia to an Italian father and Somalian mother, Camilla Bini moved with her family, which included her parents and one sister, to Turin, Italy at the age of 12. Here she attended school and eventually got a job at a local stamp company where she was still working at the time of her disappearance. According to Camilla's sister, the 34-year-old planned to visit friends in Puglia, around 600 miles south of Turin, in August of 1989. A family friend had also invited her to spend some time in Varazze. However, Camilla would never reach either of these destinations. She was last seen alive on August 8th. That evening, her neighbor invited her over for a drink at her flat. The pair met at 6.30 p.m., and afterwards, the neighbor left for their summer holiday. It is not known what happened to Camilla after this, but it took nearly three weeks for the 34-year-old to be reported missing. On August 28th at 9.30 a.m., her employers called her family to note that she had failed to return to work. Camilla's family headed to her home, searched the apartment, and called friends and other relatives looking for her. Nothing was missing from Camilla's home, and interestingly, her fridge was fully stocked. However, two coffee cups and two glasses had been used and were unwashed on the kitchen table. One cup had lipstick on the rim, which was not a shade Camilla wore, and the investigators thought she may have been visited by someone on the day of her disappearance. For reasons unknown, the glasses and cups were not checked for prints. Detectives investigated Camilla's life heavily, but found nothing to indicate what might have happened to her. They were unable to come up with any motives as to why someone would want to harm her, or why she might want to disappear. In the spring of 1998, her sister attempted to reach out to the district attorney who was initially running the investigation, but was told, bizarrely, that there were no case files concerning Camilla. In 2003, the popular Italian TV show, Chi Visto, profiled the 34-year-old's case, and while working on the investigation, 
discovered that Camilla was due to go on holiday with a co-worker at the time of her disappearance. This co-worker, Beatrice Delacrosse, was dating a man involved with right-wing extremist terrorism. Paolo Stropiano was already on the police's radar due to his criminal history and a theory that he was linked with another disappearance. That of a woman named Marina di Medica, a 39-year-old speech therapist living in Turin in the spring of 1996. She went missing on May 8th, and her diary, discovered during a search of her home, revealed she planned to meet Stropiana to discuss stamps, along with a woman named Bianca, who was a mutual friend of the two. Stropiana, for his part, initially denied having met Marina, but later changed his statement, claiming that he was supposed to meet her, but he had called her and cancelled because his back hurt. He added that he denied knowing her because his girlfriend was very jealous. Investigators promptly poked holes in Stropiana's story, however, when they searched phone records and found that only one phone call had taken place between the two, two days before Marina vanished. Stropiana then claimed he had called her from a public phone box and looked up her number in a phone directory, but these had been removed from phone boxes in 1994. Stropiana eventually went to trial in connection with Marina's disappearance. Despite a lack of evidence and motive, he was convicted and sentenced to 14 years for manslaughter and was released in 2019. He did not serve his full sentence, being released early. He denies being involved with Camilla's disappearance and Marina's and stated, I served an unjust sentence. Camilla's disappearance has never been solved. The investigation into her vanishing came to a halt early on and has never been reopened. Stropiana is still considered a suspect in her case, however. Neighbors recognized him and his girlfriend Beatrice as having visited Camilla on several occasions. The two also worked for the same company, and there were rumors that they were romantically involved. Beatrice initially claimed that Camilla had changed her plans to go on holiday with her, and then later said that no arrangements had been made between the two at all. Camilla's disappearance is thought to be linked to that of four other women between the ages of 21 and 46 who vanished from Turin between 1986 and 1995. Their cases are also unsolved. If you have any information about Camilla's disappearance, you can contact Kila Visto using the email address 8262 at rai.it. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.